I'm one of the co-directors of ultrasound in our emergency department. Uh, I have no personal disclosures, but I am going to be discussing some research we do that's funded by GE. Uh, rather than talk about one specific research project, I want to cover a little bit more globally some of the research we do in our department uh, on ultrasound. Unfortunately, 12 minutes isn't enough to cover all the cool things we do, so I, I almost want to apologize up front for all the people who've done really cool work with us that I'm not going to be able to cover today. Uh, what I really want to talk about is my career goal, my life's work, which is that by the end of my career, I want to put myself out of a job. Uh, I think that we don't have airway directors, we don't have cardiac arrest directors in the emergency department. We just expect that as part of emergency medicine, people know how to do cardiac arrest work and know how to do airway work. I think ultrasound should be the same way. And so how do we do that? How do we take ultrasound from being this kind of subspecialty discipline to being something that's just in the water, just part of what we do? Uh, I think there's two big attacks. One attack is that we should teach everyone to do ultrasound. We have to make it really easy to do. We should make it so easy that everyone wants to do it. And this is a room, an area where there's room for a lot of innovation. There's room for us to change how the ultrasound machines work and make them more user friendly and also make them do more stuff automatically for us. And that's something that I think U of M can uniquely do to help with making my job obsolete. The other thing we can do is we can work on the education side. We can just teach everyone to do ultrasound early in their training all the time. Uh, and everyone doesn't necessarily mean just doctors. So this is where we do a lot of our work as well. A lot of our research is in educational theory and teaching other people to do ultrasound. So we teach the residents, we teach the medical students. We've actually recently published a paper on teaching ultrasound in Ghana and using medical students to help do that. And recently we've started teaching our survival flight nurses, which has been really cool and really exciting. And Ross has put a lot of time and effort into making this program work. And so our survival flight team has really recently gotten access to ultrasound machines that are handheld, portable, and can be used in flight. Uh, but I think one of the other things that's really good about thinking about educational research is how do we get people excited to learn about ultrasound? And one of the ways we've done this in ultrasound education is we've done this through gamification. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the residents. Uh, every year we send our residents to SAM and they participate in something called Sono Games, which is an educational competition in ultrasound that makes people want to spend a lot of time learning ultrasound in their free time and also provides unique and cool ways to do high fidelity and low fidelity modeling of ultrasound in a non-clinical setting. So recently we've accepted or had a manuscript accepted on Sono Slam, which is a similar competition aimed at early learners that educating medical students. And so this is a picture of two of our incoming interns, Erica Rakumis and uh, John Porath, dressed up for their Sonoslam competition. I highly encourage you to take pictures of this and show them to them later. So we do a lot of education. We want to teach everyone, but we still want to make the ultrasound itself easier to use and make the ultrasound do more of the work for us. So how do we do that? Uh, I think the answer is through automation. Uh, if you follow tech news, you might be familiar with the idea of self-driving cars. We, we just put a computer in the car that can do the driving for us, that can also have vision, computer vision. And I think that there's the same opportunity to do this with ultrasound. Let the ultrasound see the image and interpret the image for you. The problem is that this is something that's going to be hard to do all at once for the foreseeable future. Doing an echocardiogram is a really difficult skill, and we don't have a robot with an articulating arm running around the department with an ultrasound machine. And so this is going to happen piecemeal. The kind of automation we're talking about is something that's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and it's probably going to come one application at a time. So rather than a robot taking my job, it's probably going to be little algorithms and little buttons that make our jobs a little easier. Image acquisition is hard, so we'll start this kind of research with image interpretation. And so this was our first foray into ultrasound automation. This is a video clip of the IVC. You can see towards the top, we have two little circles that indicate where we have the algorithm tracking. And we can track and then graph how those points move relative to each other over time. Uh, the computer then can automatically calculate how much respiratory variation there is. And this is one of the ways that we measure volume responsiveness in the emergency department. We presented this a couple years ago at AIUM, and actually this algorithm uh, works just about as well 
with about the same inner rate of reliability as me and one of my colleagues do relative to each other. So it's pretty darn good, so long as you have a pretty good image. So what else can we automate? Well, I really want to focus on removing me from existing as a subspecialty, which means taking the things that I do that require a lot of expertise and automating those tasks. Uh, and so we want to take tasks that are tedious and tasks that are hard for people and automate those. One of those is VTI. And VTI is a way that we can measure cardiac output. Basically, we measure the blood flow leaving the heart into the aorta, and we calculate exactly how much flow there is, and then using models, estimate the cardiac output. It's surprisingly difficult to do. You really need to be very precise, and you need to make a good measurement. And GE's actually been working to automate this. So on the new GE machines, there is a button you can press when you have the right image, and when you have that image, you'll get this box. And this box will pick points, estimate the VTI, manually measure it for you, and then it'll also give you a green box that'll say, red, yellow, green, is this image of high enough quality? So in this clip, the box is green. That's the, the computer algorithm giving you the AOK. -okay. Good to go. And we compared this to our manual measurements. And in this case, the algorithm turned out to be just about as good as measuring uh, cardiac output as Michael Cover, who's really good at ultrasound. It doesn't always do quite that well. This is data we'll be presenting at SAEM. But the algorithm works almost as well as our integrated reliability from person to person. And this is a pretty good estimate of cardiac output. But that's not enough. I want to go deeper. I said that we want to put me out of a job, and that means that we really want to get from where we are now to full automation. How do we take the image acquisition out of the doctor's hands and put it in the hands of the machine? Well, I don't see a way to do this for echocardiography, which is sad because I love echocardiography. But that's something that just requires a lot of hands-on skill. So I think if you're going to work on automating image acquisition, you have to start somewhere where the anatomy is more accessible so that the machine doesn't have to do a lot of work to do the image acquisition itself. So we have a platform that we're building to work on that problem. We have a prototype ultrasound sensor that you can see here applied to one of our engineers' necks. Uh, it's a very low profile ultrasound sensor that doesn't have uh, take up a lot more room than one of our other clinical monitors and can be held in place with a sticker kind of like a tagoderm. The idea is here to take, take the ultrasound that you see out of the picture, have the sensor gather the image, interpret the image, and then give you a waveform and an index number, kind of like a pulse oximeter. And the idea being, here you get to use ultrasound, but it's fully automated. You are removed from the process. So here's what our sensor looks like. It's really pretty small, pretty compact, and it can be applied in an essentially blind fashion, which is pretty cool. So what do you use this sensor for? I think we're still deciding what all of the applications are, but we're studying two initially. And with the help from the grant from the Massey TBI challenge, we're studying whether or not this sensor can calculate a surrogate for cerebral blood flow by measuring blood flow through the internal carotid. So we have some initial data from a phantom. This isn't on someone's carotid. This is through a phantom that gives us a set amount of flow. And we can see, you can imagine the X and Y tracings on this image are the image itself, and the Z number is how much flow there is on the image. And so the machine can detect and calculate how much flow there is across the image. We want to do more with this, though. And one of the questions that's always near and dear to my heart is what we get asked to do on shift most regularly. And the thing we get asked to do on shift more than anything else is, hey, does this person need more fluid? So can we use this sensor to evaluate for volume responsiveness or volume status? And there's a couple of challenges that you have to address if you really want to address an automatic interpretation for volume responsiveness. Step one is that the machine has to get a high quality image, which we're working on with the sensor in general. Step two is, once you have an image, you have to prove that the computer can actually detect the blood vessel on this image. And so here we have an algorithm running on this clip that really demonstrates the computer algorithm trying to determine where the blood vessels are. And you can see that it pretty accurately determines where the edge of the carotid is and where the edge of the internal jugular is on this image. It's not perfect, but it's a great start.
You can imagine that from here, the next problem you have to address is getting that waveform and that index number that I talked about. And so here we're tracking that same blood vessel with set points over time and generating a waveform that's kind of a moving average. From this waveform, you could calculate a number that determines whether or not someone would likely be responsive to fluid or not. And if, we, if this works, we could fully automate probably with the most, one of the most common clinical questions we get asked to solve in clinical ultrasound. It, it's, not, it's not all the way there, but it's definitely a big step on the way to making me obsolete. Uh, I'd love to take some questions. So, so this is really exciting work. In, in terms of the automation, can you just comment on where things are going with sort of the 3D reconstruction ultrasound that uh, the work is being done, where you basically are just scanning over the body and then the, you get a 3D re reconstruction of the image that you're trying to capture? Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of work going on in 3D ultrasound. There's kind of two big approaches. One is one that's probably more relevant to emergency care, where you use a two-dimensional array of ultrasound sensors to gather a three-dimensional full, like, real-time image. Uh, that requires a lot more expensive equipment, and so I think a lot of the research on that is stalled because very few people have the equipment to work with. Uh, just recently, Duke got a grant to study using literally a sensor very similar to the, the acceleration sensor in your iPhone in a plastic housing that attaches to your ultrasound probe and generating a three-dimensional uh, figure from that, uh, basically in the way you describe. You do a scan, it sees the acceleration and reconstructs it. There's a lot of work going on in that. I think one of the big questions is, what's the killer application for 3D ultrasound in that way? Is it useful to get that kind of precision in the anatomy? Is there a lot of benefit over just the two-dimensional images? And I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity there, but there's also definitely a little work to be done in finding the right use case. Thanks very much, Nick.